Hi, my name's Natasha and this is FBO History. Now today we're going to be talking about the Radium Girls and it's a really incredible story. I cannot wait to get into it. So let's just get into it, right? Radium was discovered in 1898 by Marie and Pierre Curie. It was quickly said to be the greatest discovery in history. Now, obviously, radium has a really, really key role to play in medicine. However, at the time, people didn't want to just put it in medicine. This was seen as a new wonder element and it could do anything, which meant that people wanted to put it in everything. And I mean everything. Radium was put in everything from coffee to toothpaste to beauty products. If you were ultra rich, you could go to a radium spa and you could even buy reusable water bottles lined with radium so all the water you drank contained this magical elixir. Then there were more industrial things like Undark, which was a paint that pretty much did what it said on the tin. It contained radium so it glowed in the dark. Clocks were a popular use for Undark. After all, it's useful to see a clock in the dark, right? One factory in Orange, New Jersey, run by United States Radium Corporation, opened in the 1910s and made a load of these clocks. And that's where our story begins. Because once the factory opened its doors, it needed people to paint on the dials for those clocks. So they hired girls to become dial painters. Being a dial painter was the job at the time. The dial painters were actually in the top 5% of all female US workers, which isn't that bad, right? Plus, if you were one of the top dial painters and you could just pump up those dials, then you could earn as much as $40,000 in today's money. Most of the dial painters were in their teens and early 20s and they loved their jobs. They made lifelong friends at the factory, got paid decently, and even managed to get their sisters and cousins jobs there too. Plus, they were surrounded by radium and supposed that they'd be imbibing its properties. They'd wear their favourite dresses to work because they'd pick up so much radium dust throughout the day that when they went out partying that night, they would literally be effervescent under the dance floor lights. One girl even used to paint radium on her teeth, so when she was on date, she'd have the brightest smile possible. But despite all the fun they were having, this was still a factory gig, and they were under pressure to create seamless products every time. So to ensure they painted the dials on with precision, they used a method called lip pointing. Now, lip pointing is exactly what it sounds like. You take your little paintbrush dipped in radium and you go, and then that way you get a really nice fine tip so you can draw in the minute dials. Now, obviously it also means that every time you go, you're swallowing a little bit of radium and you'd be doing that at least a couple of times every minute. Now, this might sound insane. Why would you knowingly ingest that amount of radium? But you have to remember, these girls thought it was safe. You could buy radium products in store that you ingested, so what was the difference? And in fact, they did actually ask their management, is this dangerous? And they were told, of course not, off you pop, get back to work. And so they did, which they thought was good because there was a big rush order about to come in. When America joined World War I, goods of radium paint became a military necessity. One in six soldiers owned a luminous watch. They were lip pointing more than ever, and by this time many of the girls found that their limbs ached all the time. But they put it down to the extra work they were doing, and so they kept on, not wanting to let down their boys at the front. After the war, the company's business started to dwindle, and so dial painting moved to part-time. Some of the girls took this opportunity to go find different jobs or to go off and get married and start families. And some stayed, including Molly McGeer. Molly's family were Italian immigrants and she, along with four of her sisters, worked as dial painters. She was bright, bubbly, and she loved her job. But then in 1921, she got toothache. She had the tooth removed, but the pain just got worse. Molly had more teeth removed and then her teeth just started falling out and where they fell, the gums never actually recovered. Soon she had a really foul smell coming from her mouth. She went to doctors, to dentists, to everyone that she could think of, but no one knew what was wrong with Molly. Then in May 1922, she realised that her jaw was starting to fall apart. She went to go see her dentist and when he examined her, he touched it and her jaw just crumbled away. By September of that year, Molly's illness had moved to her throat 
and started to ravage her jugular vein. Molly died. She was just 24 and her death was put down to syphilis. The same month that she died, another dial plant opened in Ottawa, Illinois. Girls were quick to apply for the dial painting job. And little did they know that a few thousand miles away in New Jersey, dial girl deaths were racking up. Helen Quinlan died in June 1923. She was followed by 21-year-old Irene Rudolph and then Catherine O'Donnell. Their causes of death, like Molly's, varied from everything from pneumonia to syphilis, which meant that even when their friend and colleague Catherine Shubb tried to get justice for the girls and launch an investigation into their deaths, there was no clear link between them and their cases were dropped. But then in 1924, the company itself, United States Radium Corporation, stepped in and decided to launch its own investigation. Now, I don't want you to get excited here because it's not that they were worried about their workers' health. No, they were worried about the fact that nobody wanted to apply for a job as a dial painter in the factory where dial painters kept on mysteriously dying. So they hired a team of medical professionals to look into this. One of those professionals was Dr. Cecil Drinker, a Harvard professor who worked on the investigation with his wife, Catherine. In the Drinker's report, they pointed out that the company was in violation of several safety hazards, as well as several things like, hey, you know that your employees glow, right? They shouldn't, they shouldn't glow. However, the company realized how damaging that this report could be. And so it never fully made its way out. This meant that at the end of the investigation, United States Radium Corporation were in the clear. And they didn't have to do anything for any of their workers. So when the doctor of one of the dial girls, Hazel Vincent, came to the company and said, hey, she's really ill, would you mind paying her medical bills? They said, no. And Hazel died just a few months later. But the Radium Girls weren't going to take this anymore. They'd lost far too many friends and many of them were now living in constant agony. And in 1925, their fight back began. Marguerite Curlow had been working for the company since she was 18 as a dial painter. Now, several years later, she'd been ravaged by this mysterious illness. She knew that she was probably going to die, but she didn't want to go out without a fight. So she decided to sue the company for $1 million in today's money. Hazel Vincent's family also joined the suit, as did Marguerite's sister, Sarah, who too was now ill with this mysterious disease. It wasn't gonna be an easy case though. Everything was up against them. And how did they prove that they actually had something to do with the company? And then, Marguerite and her sister Sarah were visited in hospital by a man called Dr. Martland. Dr. Martland was the new medical examiner of Essex County, and he took Sarah in for a series of tests. This was really important as it was the first proper radium testing that would be done on any of the dial painters. They ran an expired air test and a gamma ray test, and both showed that Sarah was riddled with radium, which she succumbed to in June 1925. Her death made headlines, even the front page of the New York Times. Then Dr. Cecil Drinker came back. The company had threatened to sue him if he revealed his full report. So he did. He just put it out there anyway. He didn't care anymore. And thanks to this and Dr. Martland's findings and Sarah's autopsy, it was clear what the mystery illness was. Radium poisoning. The girls all had it. Finally, the dial workers had a case against the company, but they'd also all just been diagnosed with an incurable illness. And just to underline that point, Marguerite died on Boxing Day, 1925. Her, Hazel's and Sarah's case against the United States Radium Corporation was settled out of court. It was a win, but a bitter one. What happened to Marguerite shook the girls. It really underlined the death sentence that they were now living under. And these were young girls with everything to live for. Some had just gotten married, some had really young children, and all of them had big dreams for the future that they now realized were never gonna come true. 
I mean, what would you do in the situation? No one could blame these girls if they just decided to leave that fight with Marguerite, go home to spend the last days that they had with their loved ones. But they didn't. They decided to step up and fight. Yes, they wanted compensation. Yes, they wanted help with their medical bills. But more than anything, they wanted to shine a light on this injustice that had gone unpunished for far too long. Grace Fryer was the first. She started work as a dial painter at 18, and now at 27, her spine had eaten away at itself so much she needed a back brace to stand. In May 1927, Grace went to the law firm Potter and Berry, and one of the founders, Raymond Berry, agreed to take her case. She was followed by Catherine Shubb, then sisters Quinta MacDonald and Albina Larice, whose sister Molly had been the first confirmed dial painter death. And finally, Edna Hussman. They became known as the Radium Girls. All were dying of radium poisoning, and Albina had even lost a child who was stillborn as a result of the condition. But they sure as hell weren't gonna rest until they saw justice. However, there were many issues with the case. One major one being that although Martland and Drinker had confirmed that yes, these girls did indicate radium poisoning, the company actually had its own doctor on site, one Dr. Flynn, and he'd been going around the workers and checking them all out and coming back to say they were in absolutely 100% perfect health. Now, that's a pretty big speed bump in a court case. However, it would be if Dr. Flynn was a doctor because it turns out, I mean, technically he was a doctor, just in philosophy. That's right. Dozens of girls with symptoms of radium poisoning had been going to a fake doctor for years, and he'd lied to them all that they were the picture of health. And if they thought that was bad, things were about to get way worse for the radium girls. Because on the 12th of January, 1928, the trial began. The trial wasn't easy physically or mentally for the girls. Edna Hussman's husband had to carry her to the witness stand as her legs could no longer move. And Albina Larice had now lost three children as a result of her radium poisoning and in her darkest moments had considered ending her life. But the defense didn't care about that. They were there for United States Radium Corporation. And so if their line of questioning was traumatic, it didn't matter. And when they did medical testing, for some reason, they involved Dr. Flynn in that. No, I don't know either. And Grace Fryer was in a position where her skin no longer healed. So when her blood was taken, the flesh around it just turned black. And still the girls didn't give in. But then in April, the judge said that court was adjourned until September. Five months. That's a long time when you're dying. The Radium Girls were devastated, but as always, they weren't done. That's when they used their trump card, the press. The girls gave interview after interview and across the country, people wrote letters calling for the trial to begin again immediately. But by the end of May, it became clear that the court was not gonna open again until September. And who knew which of the girls would be alive by then? So they decided to go in for that settlement. The United States Radium Corporation agreed, but with the adage that the girls had to undergo regular medical testing by their doctors. Everyone agreed because, well, why wouldn't you? Happy endings, right? Nope. Because if you haven't guessed by now, United States Radium Corporation were terrible, terrible people. By now, the girls had lived until 1929, which was far longer than anyone predicted that they would, and the United States Radium Corporation weren't exactly thrilled to still be paying out. So they started to work out ways to cut back on payments, quibbling over every single medical bill that the girls put through. Not only that, but they decided to try and get rid of Raymond Berry. He was now representing other dial painters in court, and, well, they didn't want that. So, on his final case, they agreed to pay out to that girl only if he agreed to never represent in court against them. He was now silenced, and the Radium Girls had lost their greatest ally. Then, in December 1929, one of the original five girls, Quinta, died. The rest were also silenced, with the United States Radium Corporation 
holding the threat of not paying their bills above them. And in 1932, the company just stopped paying the bills. Shortly after, Catherine died, and then Grace did too. And because a clause in the girls' settlement with United Radium Corporation said that they weren't culpable for their illnesses, dial painting was still going on, including in that plant in Ottawa, Illinois, which was run by a company called Radium Dial. And there, history was about to repeat itself. In 1931, one of the Ottawa dial painters, Catherine Wolfe Donahue, was fired after nine years of work, as she was showing signs of radium poisoning. And just like with the New Jersey case, this wasn't radium dial looking after their workers' health, but their own arses. Back in 1925, the company had actually said that yes, they knew radium poisoning was a thing, and although they stopped doing lip pointing as much, they still didn't provide an alternative, meaning that many of the women were painting with their fingers. Not much better. In 1928, the Ottawa dial painters were tested, and out of 67 girls, over half showed signs of radium poisoning. They didn't tell their workers this. And they continued to lie to their workers. When the New Jersey case broke, they actually went to great lengths telling their workers that their radium paint was actually different and totally safe even though they knew that it wasn't. They'd even already had several girls die, including 24-year-old Peg Looney, who'd worked right up until the week of her death. In return, the company pushed through her funeral in record time, so there couldn't be further tests done on her body. Yeah, I think we can all agree that Radium Dial are giving United States Radium Corporation a run for their money in the sketchy stakes. But unfortunately for them, that wasn't the only thing that they had in common, because their workers, they were about to rise up too. Just like the New Jersey radium girls, the Ottawa dial painters fought back. In 1934, a big group of them filed a suit against radium dial. And radium dial, they didn't even deny the claims. They just sat back and assumed that they'd already won. They had the money, they had the power. Who are these sick girls to try and fight back? in the end the case was lost due to a legal technicality but Illinois legislators did write in a new clause which meant that from 1936 industrial poisoning would come under the Illinois Occupational Diseases Act but 1936 was going to be too late for so many of these girls in Ottawa they were dying at a rapid rate and back in New Jersey the United States Radium Corporation was still throwing out cases of dial painters it seemed like the girls were doomed no matter what they did. But just like always, they refused to lie down. They stood up and carried on fighting. And again, they went to the press for help. Soon the stories of the Ottawa dial painters were all over the country. And once more, there was a call for justice. In 1938, several of the women teamed up and managed to secure a court case against radium dial. They included Catherine Wolfe Donahue, who was now a mother of two and the illness that Radium Dial had once fired her for was now so bad she was at death's door. She was joined by Charlotte Purcell, a mother of three, she'd actually lost her arm to radium poisoning. Then there was Fiery Marie Becker Rossetier, who'd been one of the first women to speak up against Radium Dial, as well as Pearl Payne, a quiet woman who loved to bake and sew. Together, the women became known as the living dead. On 10th of February, 1938, Catherine's case against Radium Dial started. She was there, as were swarms of media, but Radium Dial, they didn't turn up. Still, Catherine took the stand and she even brought with her a box containing fragments of her jaw that she could show the judge. Later on, a medical examiner took the stand he confirmed that Catherine had radium poisoning, and then he was asked how long Catherine had to live, and he said months. Catherine collapsed. She didn't know that her condition was going to be fatal. She was a mother to two children. She was married to an amazing man, and just like that, she found out she was going to die. Catherine was taken to bed, but, she refused to give up. 
instead turning to her husband and saying, yes, I can't go back to court tomorrow, I'm too ill, but let's bring the court here. And so the next day, a bedside hearing took place. As her children played upstairs, Catherine talked to the court and explained how she'd lip pointed, how after the New Jersey court case, she'd even asked if she was in danger and was told she wasn't. Radium Dial didn't offer a line of defense, just that radium wasn't poisonous. Whilst they waited for a verdict, Catherine, Marie, Pearl and Charlotte formed the Society of the Living Dead, a group that would fight for better rights for people endangered by the industrial disease. Then, on the 5th of April 1938, the verdict in Catherine's case came back. Radium Dial were guilty. Not only did the company have to pay almost $100,000 in today's money to Catherine, but they were also culpable for the deaths of Peg Looney and many other Dial girls. This also meant that those dying of radiation poisoning now could confidently take Radium Dial to court for compensation. But Radium Dial being Radium Dial, they weren't done. And so on the 26th of July, they filed an appeal. And a day later, Catherine died. It was a tragedy that could have derailed everything. But Catherine didn't go out without swinging one last punch at radium dial. On her death certificate, it was ruled that Catherine had died as a result of the industrial poisoning she'd gotten while working underneath radium dial. They were guilty, and the appeal found that too. The case was thrown out, and finally, the floodgates were opened. The radium girls had finally seen justice. The story of the Radium Girls is undeniably tragic and cruel. We don't know how many dial painters died, but whatever the number, it was too many young lives lost. However, this story is also one of hope and overcoming insurmountable odds. These brave young women left a legacy that not only helped other dial painters, but built America's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which today looks after millions of workers. So there you have it, the Radium Girls. If you're looking for even more things to read in about the Radium Girls, and I highly suggest that you do, it's super interesting, please check out the description box down below where I've put some links to amazing books and articles and even a couple of papers on the Radium Girls. And if you're looking for even more history goodies, don't forget to follow us, FBI History, on all the socials, apart from Instagram, because I'm still an old lady and I don't know how to work it, I'm sorry. You can also find even more on our website, fbihistory.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next week.